The following program is paid for by EG Tax. All opinions or statements expressed on this program are solely those of EG Tax or its guests and do not reflect the opinions of News Radio 930 WBEN or Odyssey. The following is paid programming. It's time to talk taxes. New friends, new opportunities, new partners. EG Tax. It's Ask the Tax Lady with Esther Gullius and EG Tax on News Radio 930 WBEN. To reach Esther now, call 803-0930, toll free at 1-800-616-9236, and cell calls are free at star 930. And now, live from the WBEN studios, it's Esther Goulias. Hi, I'm Esther Goulias, the tax lady from EG Tax, um, and I'm joined in studio with Christopher Fabian, and this week, we're just answering your email so we're not taking live phone calls uh of course if you ever need anything getting love letters from the federal government where they it doesn't look like a love letter at all looks like a demand for payment just don't even think about it just give us a call at our corporate headquarters you can find our phone number at our website egtax.com we want to help there's no charge for us to help you to decipher an irs letter the only time we would charge is if we actually do something to help you uh, with your tax situation. And of course, if you're one of our clients, we just guarantee that we guarantee the tax return. And so I'm joined in studio with Christopher Fabian. Hey, Chris, how you doing? Hello, Esther, doing so good. Tiff, so Tiff's playing hooky today, Tiff's right? playing hooky, yes. All right, well, that's good. We can, we're gonna chew up emails, no phone calls today. We'll be back uh, next week answering telephone your your telephone questions and during the week if you go to our website ask the tax lady we'll help you that's right right that's right all right what do we got here chris um tommy writes in my mom just got a bill from the irs saying she owes money all she has is social security of twenty four thousand a year and some gambling income of twenty thousand but on her win loss statement she's negative by nearly five thousand do I just mail in the proof of the win loss statement to the IRS? What a sweet what a sweet letter this is. That's so sweet. It's so naive. Right? <laughs> That's not the way the, the law works. When you gamble, the whole amount that you won is income. Right. Then if you can itemize whatever your gambling losses are up to the income is an itemized deduction. So in her situation, she has the income, and she, which then made her Social Security partially taxable, right? Yeah, almost, uh, probably almost all 85%. Right, and then she has uh, gambling losses up to her income. Yes. So, and so she ends up owing money. Yeah, she'll owe a little bit of money to the IRS, and that's probably why she got the bill, because... Right. You, she netted it or you netted it on the page. Right, but now if she has property taxes because she has the itemized deduction of 20000 right? Yep. So she, if she had property taxes of maybe 5000 and maybe some charity, she might be able to zero it out. So the important thing is to come on down to our office and we will see if we can't do an amended return. And, uh, well, actually, it wouldn't be an amended return. It would be an original return to help her. Right, right, right. And also, you know, the the sales tax is a write-off. Yep. So there are different things we could use to... Yeah, so in her situation, she'd have the sales tax. She bought a new car, that would help. Her property taxes, if she owns a home, if she has any mortgage interest, yay. And charity, yay. And then her gambling. So mm -hmm. she might came, come out smelling like a rose, but not until she submits it to the IRS, because that's the language they talk in forms correct yes yes and okay, then what else we got speaking of itemized deductions jenny writes in i just paid forty thousand dollars for dental work done on me i put the bill on my medical charge card zero interest for one year just when can i take the dental work as a deduction this year or when i pay what i pay on the charge card okay so what's the answer chris well, because it's put on a charge card, it's considered paid. So you will get to use it this year, which right. is a good thing because you get to use it all in one year. And then uh, since since she can use it and she's got 40000 so she 
that has to be reduced by 7.5% of her adjusted gross income. She wants to make sure that she includes glasses and um, uh, prescriptions and co-pays and everything when she's figuring her tax return. So if she has an opportunity to take care of another <laughs> physical problem, uh, you know, so that she can load up her medical, that would make the most sense, right? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And yeah, right. so you want to make sure you have everything. If you need, if, you know, oh, maybe I should get glasses. Get them this year while you're right. doing your teeth. You Absolutely. know, whatever you need done, get it. I hate to say that. Get it done because let's take advantage of that medical write-off. Right. Absolutely. Yep. All right. What else we got? Um, no, oh, this is a very common question this year. Ashley writes in, Esther, this year I only received a refund of ninety-eight dollars. I usually get around thirteen hundred dollars. What happened? I didn't change any of my withholdings. I don't know. How do you have an answer, Chris? I do. Okay. Well, the you didn't change anything. The government changed things. Oh, you're talking about that they found out she owed money. No. She no, her refund dropped to ninety eight dollars. Yeah, I'm but, right. But I'm so saying. the government changed the withholding tables during twenty twenty three. Oh, you're talking about when her return was prepared. Yes. I'm thinking that when her refund got processed they reduced her refund. <laughs> no. Okay, so yeah, the withholding charts really did change. And I wanna tell you something. If you're somebody that was really disappointed with your refund this year in 2023, you have to make sure, and of course, let's face it, a bunch of the year is gone already. Yes, yep, right, right. So, I mean, we're in, you know, in June-ish, so June-ish, June -ish. <laughs> we're in June. <laughs> um, so that's, you know, five months of the year is already behind us. So, so if you change your W-4 at work, most of the year is gone, so you want to kind of make that a heavier deduction for the rest of the year if you were not happy with last year's results. Right, right. But more than anything, since it is June-ish, you can call us with your pay stub, and we can pretty much project how everything's going to look at the end of the year so that we can guide, guide you with a little more accuracy. Right, and the new W-4, I mean, I shouldn't say new. It's been out there for four or five years now is very confusing you know us oh old, my gosh us old people <laughs> well we remember when it made sense right when it was just i mean they're absolutely overdoing it right it was simply just one page um single and i have one dependent or i have no dependents married right. two right now you have to go to to the worksheets and the chart in the back because if you're a two income family or a two single with two mm -hmm. incomes they calculate all that in there in the, with the withholdings to make sure you do adequate withholdings. Because if you don't tell them about your spouse who's working, you're probably going to end up owing at the end of the year because it's going to be under withheld. Right. So. Okay. I'm Esther Golias, the tax lady from EG Tax. Our, our phone number uh, during the week is 632-7886. Our website is egtax.com. We're going to take a short break and we'll be back on the other side. Hi, I'm Esther Goliath, the tax EG Tax. Our, uh, our email address is egtax.com. We are talking taxes, but mostly uh, we're talking about your emails, which gives us an opportunity to kind of really peel back some of the layers of tax code. Uh, if you have any questions, you can go to our website at egtax.com. And of course, I'm joined in studio with Christopher Fabian. Okay, Chris, what do we got? Okay, Larry says, EG Tax, my son is starting a new business and asked if I could help fund him $200,000. He said, a good dad. I, yeah, he, he's given me the option, do it as a loan or become a shareholder slash partner. What do you think is the best way? Hmm. I mean, if it ends up being a great business, you'll be great. You'll be thankful you're a partner. Right? Right. Because all you can do if you loan on the money is to get interest. But um, if, if you're, um, if you really, if everything isn't arm's length and you loan on the money, uh, the IRS can say, well, this is your son 
and this looks like it was a gift. So you have to make sure that everything is done exactly to Hoyle to make sure that whatever you do, whether it's you become a shareholder or loan the money, that you have proof that you said, this is the interest rate, this is the payment, and and in the event that he de defaulted because he couldn't do it, that you go after him legally. Right, right, right. I mean, and then just vice versa too, if you become a partner, you're equally responsible for, for, everything. for everything in the business as well. The debt, um, the if somebody gets hurt, depend. I don't know, it doesn't say what type of business, but if somebody gets hurt, there could be a lawsuit, you know, so you really got to be protected in whatever you choose. Um, is your son, I hate, is your son trustworthy? <laughs> well, I mean, and that's a really, that's, that, I mean, I can think of one of my clients who, whose son kind of flits around, right? He's doing this, he's a greenskeeper, he's, um, he's over here in Nevada, he's a hiker, and now he's in California, he's opening a restaurant, and the dad loves the son, right? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what kind of works against you in the event of an audit, because the IRS says, don't you love your son? And you go, yes, I love my son. Well, then they go, okay, then you gave him a gift. And that's kind of what you want to make sure. You kind of have to have that crusty exterior that says this is a business arrangement. I'm not interested in doing anything unless, it doesn't, unless it's a business arrangement. And then you have to go after him, guns blazing, if you want the IRS to allow you to take a loss from a, from a business uh, venture. Right, and then it's a real important decision. And then Esther, it's a new business. Boi. Boi, that's another thing. Did the boi get done, or if it's not, if he's not a LLC or yet or a corporation, when he does, he's got because it's a new one started in 2024. He's got 90 days to register it with the. But what is a boi, Chris? It's a boy. <laughs> <laughs> It's a beneficial ownership information report because that's sent to that's sent to the federal government through their financial crime network. Yes, yeah, so it's a real fun website to look at. <laughs> and they have everything but but jail uh, things, and, and it's very important. So if you're a brand new limited liability company, eleven twenty S Subchapter S Corporation, or uh, a partnership. You and you did that in 2024. You have 90 days to register with B O I Fen Sen to to let them know who the beneficial partners are in the business, or the the fine can be up to uh, it's um, up grand. to ten grand. Yeah, yeah, five hundred right? dollars a day. And if it's an if it's a business before. 2024, you have the whole year to register. And again, if you fail to register, uh, the the fine can be up to uh, $10,000. And actually, there's six months jail, jail term uh, if you, uh, up to $200,000 fine. Right. It's and very it's a very serious thing. If you are, have a small business, um, rental property, uh, LLC, Subchapter S partnership, call us. EG Tax will help you to get registered with the um, Financial with the Crimes brief. Network. Just where you just wanted, to, you, we really wanted to get registered with the Financial Crimes <laughs> Network, right? Right, right, right. And, I mean, and the thing is, it's not just that when you have to do it. Like, say, the son started an S corporation, then he took on his dad. Right, he gave dad forty percent shares because dad invested in it. Well, they have to update their BOI and then put dad on it. And if and you only have thirty days to do that. If you don't update it, then the penalties could start. Right. So then, it, so if it's a brand new business in twenty twenty four, you got ninety days. But if there's a change in ownership in an existing business, you only have thirty days. Yep. It's very serious. It so you is. You want to make sure if you need help that you give EG Tax a call, and you're basically interested in BOI, right? Beneficial ownership information. Exactly. Yes. Right? Yes. All right. What else we got here, Chris? Um, I am 62 and thinking of retiring. 
between my pension and my savings, I can survive until I reach full retirement age and start collecting Social Security. Is there anything else I need to consider before I do this? William. Well, I mean, you have to take a look at how much you're leaving on the table. And then you have to look at your health and your um, in income needs because it may be better for you at age 62 to start withdrawing from your Social Security because what people don't realize, if you were entitled to, let's say, for instance, 2000 a month, you're leaving on the table 24000 for five years, which is $120,000. Well, it takes a lot of money to make up $120,000. Yep. So you want to make sure what's your health, Do you, you know, uh, realizing that you won't break even until you're like 83, you know, all, all those things come into play. So you want to find out how much your actual benefit is, how much you would get at age 66, and you can call us and we'll We'll work it out for you. We'll look at the numbers. And, you know, you keep mentioning health. What about your health insurance costs? That's, you know, are you going to go on the marketplace? Did you get health insurance yeah. through through your pension? If you're 62. Right, right, because that's a major determination factor. Um, also, what if what if his pension is only like 750 a month? And... You know, and he has social security. He's not on social security. He's living off his savings. What else can he do? Well, you can take money out of his pension plan tax free. Right. So that gives him an opportunity to kind of uh, really rob Peter. One of the benefits that people talk about out of a Roth is it's tax free. Well, guess what? With your standard deduction, if you're a married couple, filing a joint return, your standard deduction is like 32,000 bucks, well 30,500 actually. And so that means you, if you don't have any taxable income, there's a lot of money you can take out tax free. And then people look at me and they say, well, what if I don't need the money? Just put it into investments because you already paid your taxes on it. Right, right. Give it to your kids. <laughs> I mean, but, you know, because that's what I'm saving it for my kids. Well, take it out tax free and give it to your kids tax free. Right. And so you don't need a Roth to take advantage of the tax laws in order for you to withdraw basically tax free, because even though it's taxable income, it's covered by your standard deduction. Right. Right. That's what we're saying. Yes. Yes. Okay. What else we got? Um, let's see. Speaking of gifts to children, Mary writes in, how much can I give my children and not pay taxes? Don't want a nursing home to get my money. Well, that's really important. The nursing home situation is you have to pretty much divest yourself of your income at least five years prior to the time, I mean, there's a, there's income limitations, but at least five years prior to the time you're going into a nursing home, if you want to be on Medicaid. Right. The, but then, but then there's this other little balancing thing about, so I can qualify for Medicaid, but the place they want to put me is not a nice place. <laughs> right? Yeah. Because if you're not private pay, they they can uh, you know, you you go where they got an opening and sometimes where the openings are, you don't want to go. Right, right. So sometimes you want to keep enough to pay for right. like to I get, think it's like 5 6 months and Absolutely. So uh but by the same token, I can think of a client that we had not long ago and she had about $600,000. Well, she's been in a nursing home now, starting her second year, and it's like a hundred. It's like a hundred and forty thousand dollars a year, right? And it's too late for her to give her children her money to go on Medicaid now. The five-year look back, it, she's going to run out of money before the five-year look back is in effect. So that's why, you know, having these kind of conversations with your children when you're healthy is really important. Right. And I know some people don't like the idea of long term care insurance because it is expensive now. It keeps going up. But say you pay seven thousand dollars a year for long term care insurance, in ten years 
you're paying seventy thousand dollars. Right. How much at fifteen thousand dollars a month? How many months would you get? Like four four months. You're covered right. in four months. So yeah, it's absolutely true. It's nobody wants to, to but long term care insurance if you qualify, is really a blessing. And some of you that did it long time ago, the premium payments are not that bad, and you just have to say kudos for them. Now, it may be in a few years that they say, we're not gonna pay it anymore. And that's what's happening with insurance companies. Yeah, yep. But I, I gotta believe they have to pay with what they've already committed to. Right, right, and then there's always like um, uh, those Oh my gosh, my mind just went blank. The communities where you start off independent living and then you move into an assisted living. Right. Canterbury Woods. Right. That's what I was thinking. It's like Canterbury Woods where you can... But you, it costs a fortune. It costs a fortune. But if you have the money and you're afraid of it, right. m- some of these places you put 250 down. And again, down. that's part of what we do. We would love to sit down with you and help you. Yes. So you can call us at, at 632-7886, Monday through Friday. Go to our website at egtax.com. We're going to take a short break right now. We'll be back on the other side. Hi, I'm Esther Gullius, the tax lady from EG Tax, in studio with Christopher Fabian, and we are doing emails today. So don't call us, not this week. Next week, we'll be taking phone calls again. But during the week, if you have a question, don't guess. Give EG Tax a call. Go to our website at egtax.com. Ask the tax lady, and we certainly want to help. Um, and of course, during the week, you can go at our come to our corporate headquarters at 632-7886 and we have staff there that talk English and we will talk to you. <laughs> we want to help. Yes. Yes. And especially if you're getting letters, you know, if you're getting letters, don't ignore the letters especially if they're dealing with identity theft, you have to answer those letters. We can't do it for you. They want to talk to you because it's your identity that that they're verifying. So we can point out figures when they're uh, asking you, but you got to say them. Right. So we're, we're there to help, but we can't make the phone call. Yes, yes. I know. I, you know, you talk about talking to a person. I just talked to someone the other day, and they're like, yeah, I'm looking into going into a switching from one brokerage firm to another, and this place is offering an AI package where the wow. AI will manage my money. Oh, my God. That's artificial intelligence. Yes, scary i mean it's scary yeah so you really i mean i love talking to people face to face over the phone you know i know my kids get mad at me when i say people should be back in the office working well they should be and because that's where you get work done you you learn skills of communicating and how important the face to face is yeah so that's for sure all right we got some some uh emails here right? we do we do um sarah writes in i just started an online coaching job i am considered self-employed my clients are all over the u.s if i travel to visit someone can i use the trip as an expense against my income okay so like everything in tax law it has to be ordinary and necessary so Let's say that your client was in Hawaii and the client calls you in January right after we have a blizzard. And the client says, wow, I'm laying on my my lanai here, I'm having a pina colada. And you you say, do you have any questions? And they say, yes, I do. And you say, wait, I'm going to come to Hawaii and I'm going to have you ask me the question in person. That's not ordinary and necessary. They'll see right <laughs> through that. However, if that same situation happened and the taxpayer said, everything is a mess, I've got all these forms, I don't know what to do with, um, I will pay, uh, I, I'll put you up in a hotel, and it's really necessary to maintain the business uh, situation, that would be different. Right. Right. You know, if you're kind of manipulating it so you can take a vacation, you can bet the auditors will see through that. <laughs> yeah, if you're there for a week and it would only take you two days to do your job, you know, that that looks a little funny. 
Right. Well, the thing is, you can only d deduct two, two the out two of the days. five days. Yep. Right. Yep. The round trip airfare would be deductible, but but while you're there, you say, "Gee, I think I'm going to go to the Kanapali Beach," you know, which would make sense. But um, but the thing is, the burden of proof is on the taxpayer to prove what they put on their return that that they can substantiate that this falls between the regulation of tax code right right and you know she needs to like look at all her other expenses that she might be missing um like an office and home i know a lot of people are still afraid to do an office and home because doesn't that throw red flags up to the government not if if you're if you're an employee, you cannot take an office at home, except on the state of New York. Right. Uh, but you can on the federal. But if you're self-employed, and that's where you're working. Yeah. And and you have a room dedicated, exclusive, and regularly for the production of income, and you're not doing it on your kitchen table and having dinner <laughs> there while you're eating. <laughs> you know, if it's really a room used regularly, and exclusively for income, it's it's a qualified business expense. Right. Right. So anything you do to your house, you would get to take that percentage of the space for your office compared to your house and get a percentage, your utility right. bills, your lawn care, your snow removal, um, anything like that you'd be able to use. Painting and electrical work, plumbing problems, it all right. adds up really fast. And so you get a percentage to total when it's, be, when it's an expense that's shared by your house in general. But if it's your actual office and you put in a new chair, you bought a new monitor, then that's 100% deductible. So there are things, if you're self-employed, that are deductible that you can't take if you're an employee, which I don't agree with, quite frankly. I, I mean, when they changed that law and um, they said that employees um, can't take expenses and they're working out of their home or they're they're traveling for their jobs I never have thought that was right yeah it, it's crazy but you know one thing I, I look at that and I understand that point but I also look at well how many of those salesmen also though got hit with AMT where you yep. could write off your 50,000 miles and your and your travel and your gifts and all your other stuff and bring your income way down, but when you get hit with AMT, you're still paying the same and much as tax as you would well, have without and so it. So AMT is alternative minimum tax. So there comes a place where you've written off so much and you're not paying taxes, but the federal government says, wait a minute, based upon your income, we won't let you pay less than this amount of taxes. Right. And so that's your minimum tax. Yes. That we have alternatively computed. Yep. Yep. Right? Yes. All right, Chris, what else we got here? Um, Mitch writes in, my mom is in a nursing home, and, and she is a private pay patient at the rate of nearly 14000 per month. She will be running out of money by next year. She's been in the nursing home since 2022. I haven't filed taxes for her because I know the nursing home is much more than her income. Right? Which is true. But until you do the form that lets the IRS know that it isn't taxable because it's an itemized deduction, they're going to be sending you a bill. And once you get into the system, then somebody has to process it to make sure that they agree with you to reduce that bill so they're not billing you again. So anytime that your person that, that you're helping a mom, a dad, an aunt, uncle, brother, sister, uh, if they have taxable income, even though you know that they're not going to owe any taxes, you still have to file the return if it's more than the minimum filing requirement. Right. And wait, she was private pay. Oh, and so she gets a big credit from New York State right. for multiple years. Right, right. So for 22, 23, and this part of 24, um, as long as this is in New York State, it doesn't say, but I'm assuming, um, then on the monthly bills, you will see a New York State assessment, and that's also called a bed tax. So you get 6% of the daily cost of 
being in the nursing home, so we'll say it's $450 a day. New York State, they charge like now 7%, something like that. But you get, on that 450 you get $27 a day, but multiply that by 365 that's $9,855. That comes back as a refundable credit. It comes back to you. Right. And so if you, here's the, the big broad brush. If you have a loved one that's a private pay patient, you have money coming back from New York State. Right, right. So here for Mitch, it's almost $20,000 roughly. Right, a year. Well, no, 9000 oh. I did. It's almost ten thousand a year. A year. So yeah, yeah. for two years, twenty thousand yeah. dollars. So, but so uh, it's very important. So if you have a private pay patient, prior to going on to Medicaid, if they go on to Medi Medicaid, you have a refundable New York State bed tax. Is it a two fifty eight? It is, I believe. Yes. Yeah. So you do New York two fifty eight, and they're going to send you the money back. Right. And so it gives you an opportunity if they give you a $1,200, $12,000 back, pays, pays for one month of their nursing home. <laughs> yep. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, this brings up, I know we get asked this a lot. At what age do I, can I stop filing my taxes? If you have income over the minimum filing requirement, you have to file a tax return. But... If you have income under the minimum filing requirement, but you're entitled to a refund, you want to file a tax return. So if you have withholding or the IT-229, uh, that is one of those forms that I just think many people have missed that completely. So if you don't have to file a tax return and you are somebody in New York State and you're paying New York State property taxes, then you want to make sure you file the New York 229 as well. Right, right. You know, and I, I, when I get asked that, I said, well, why don't we call my 99-year-old client and ask him about that age requirement? Because <laughs> the age has nothing to do with right. taxes. It's I mean, whether you have income. It's, it's all based upon income. And, and really, and many people, they don't have to pay taxes, but they qualify for credits. Yep. So if you have refundable credit, you want to file to get your money back. Right, right. Yep. I mean, so you got to really plan everything right and do it and let, let the numbers fall and see, you know, if you have to file, you have to file. It's no big deal. But if you don't have to file, you still want to file if you got money if coming If you got back. the credits coming back, yes. I mean, think about it. If you had 350 for the last three years, you got over $1,000. Yep. But if you don't file, they're not going to mail it to you, even though they know you get it. Right. They're not going to say, hey, Mitch, you know what? Your mom missed this, and she's right. entitled to this money. No, they're not going to do that. Well, okay, so if this week you go to your mailbox and you got one of those darn letters, um, if you go to the mailbox and you got another letter that says we want to verify your ID, just give EG Tax a call. Go to our website at egtax.com. We want to help you. To us, your family, for us to look at your the letters that they sent you, there's no charge. We just want to help so that you're pointed in the right direction. <laughs> Are we going to take a short break? We'll be back on the other side. Hi, I'm Esther Gullius, the tax lady from EG Tax. Uh, this week, we're not taking your phone calls. We're just chewing up emails. I'm joined in the studio with Christopher Fabian. Uh, and I, if you have any questions, you're getting love letters, you're wondering what the heck, if you got any questions uh, regarding your whether your uh, withholding is, is uh, adequate, this being almost the half of the year mark, good time to pull out your pay stub give us a call to see how you're tracking because especially if last year you didn't track very well you want to make sure that you're on track right right all right christopher what do we got okay it says um the text says eg tax why do i get a 1099 b every year i don't take any money out of my brokerage account okay because if you make money that you can take out of your brokerage account. If you make money that you can take out of your 
out of your savings account. Then the money that you earn that you're just leaving in there is taxable. Right. Well, and, and it could be your broker is repositioning you. So they're buying and selling, not you. Or maybe you did you didn't take the money out, but you did sell so you sold ABC stock and you bought XYZ instead. And you might not even know it. Right. Right. But so. they have control over your account and they traded it because they thought it was a good move to make. Well, that might have been a twenty five thousand dollar gross sale, but then you reduce it by your cost basis and you only pay taxes on your gain. But again, if that money was available to you, that's why it's taxable. Exactly. I mean you gotta you gotta understand those brokerage statements and they can be very confusing you should look at if you get a monthly statement or quarterly look at them and question your broker quest you know you know if you're a do-it-yourselfer well question yourself <laughs> um, i mean but the, and the thing is you, you really do have to watch i was one of my clients um has a, a not-for-profit and they have about four hundred thousand dollars a year in fundraising which they spend during the year um for the services they provide people with Alzheimer's. And 400,000, when you take a look at a 5% interest, they should be doing about $20,000 a year in income, right? Simple math. Well, so far this year, they've lost about $8,000. And so I take care of their books and I mentioned, I said, you know, really, you should be making some money. You've lost 8000 Well, their broker was churning the account, buying and selling, buying and selling, buying and selling, not making them any money, but she was making commissions. So it's up to you to take a look at what's happening on your brokerage statement. And if you don't know how to read your bro brokerage statement, come on in. We'll show you how to read it. Right. Yep. Come in with the brokerage statement, though. Yes. <laughs> and your tax return. Right. So we can look at everything. But yes, and then Al writes in, Esther, what a mess this year was. I had to take out over 100000 from my 401k to keep my company going. Now I owe $30,000 in taxes. I need help. Please and thank you. Well, the money that you took out of your formerly the tax deductible pension plan is fully taxable. That's one transaction. Then if you loan the money to your corporation, I don't know if it's 1120S or uh, C Corp, then that is just a capital con uh, infusion of capital that you did in your business. So if it's a, it was an 1120S, then those expenses you pay would then flow through to your personal return and you'd end up getting them on the back end. Right, and that's hopefully, you know, if, <laughs> If it is a C Corp, you really need to talk to somebody to figure out why you're not an S Corp because if you're losing that money, that loss just goes right out there. And Until you get rid of the stock. Yep, yep. So, I mean, but if it is an S Corp and you still owe that kind of money, was your tax return done right? Because Yeah, that's true. What's what's going on? Because why? in order for an S Corp to pay expenses, they need money. Yep. When you gave the S Corp, if it was an S Corp, the 100000 and they paid expenses, m my thought process would be that there would be at least $100,000 loss. You, you know, would think, right? yes. And so then you got the income on the left-hand side, but you got the expense on the right-hand side, and the one should cancel each other out. So Chris is right in saying, are you sure that your account accountant did it right? Now, if you're a C Corp, then you it really begs the question, why did no one make you an S-Corp? Right. And that's one of the things that they're proposing in Biden's uh, tax law change is to take the C-Corp rate from a flat rate of 21% to 28%. So that's another 7% kicker in the teeth. Yep. So if your business is not making a lot of money and it's a C-Corp, I would strongly suggest you look into doing an S-Corp because then it just flows over to your personal return and you might only pay 10% in taxes rather than 21% or later 28%. And then when you take the money out, it's taxable again. Right. Yep. 
So double taxation, you know, you got to really, you know, sit down with your tax person and have them explain to you why you are, you know, if I lost money, why am I owing money on my personal side and figure it out. It's your business. It's your money. You need to know what's going right. on. Right. Yep. So. Okay. We got anything else here? We Chris? do. Um, Esther, my mom just recently moved into my house. After my father passed, her income became just her Social Security, about 1300 a month. What do I mean, need to do to claim her on my taxes? Jonathan. Okay. So that's $15,600 a year. So in order to claim mom as, as a other dependent, then you have to show that you gave more than $15,601 towards her total support. So then you gotta say, what did mom do with her 15,600? Now let's say mom put $10,000 of it away. So then all she had was $5,600 to live on. Then you have to do, how much was your house worth, if, if, you know, the housing thing, the house, the utilities, the, the food and the insurance and upkeep for the house. And if it was just you and your mom there and the cost of maintaining the house was 30,000, then your share for her would be 15,000. And if she had put the money away in the, in the bank account, then you could claim her. But if she had spent that whole amount of money on her own support, then if you can't prove that you gave over 51% to her total support, then you can't claim her. But here's the good news. She's only worth $500. <laughs> I mean, and I hate to put it like that. Right. But right, that's right. all you're missing. Right. Is it worth the headache for $500? Right. I mean, I, I've done this with clients, okay, so I'm gonna kick you out of the house, how much are you gonna rent the house to me, fully furnished, and we do all this, and, and then they go, oh, we're so close, we're 100 Okay, well, let, let me just put it to you this way. And it, usually it's a highly compensated taxpayer. Your mom's only worth $500. What, that's it? That's true. Now, the opposite is true if you are a single taxpayer, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you claim your mom, then what happens to your filing status? Well, then you go from single to head of household. Head of household. So then it's a really good thing. Right. More than $500. <laughs> I hate to say mom's only worth $500. But, but technically on a tax return, that's, that's true. I mean, and, you know, the, nowadays with Social Security getting higher and higher for people who are receiving it, it does question, you know, the IRS will question it. You know, mom got 15000 How did you spend 15000 on mom? They're going to question it. And you got to provide the proof. You got to have the receipts. You got to have, you know, your utility bills, your Wegmans or Tops bills, your everything you say you spent on her, you better have those receipts. Now, of course, if mom had also given away the money, like if she got fifteen six and she gave ten thousand dollars in gifts to your siblings, that also would mean that all she would have had towards her support is the fifty six hundred. So you have to be and the, and then the thing that is such a conundrum many times is you say, what did mom do with her, the money? And they go, oh, I could never ask my mother what she did with the money. <laughs> well, then guess what? Then if you can't ask your mom what you did with the money, we can't put her as a dependent because we we have to know what she did with the money. Right, right. Yep. I mean, it's you know you got to ask the questions. You got to. I mean, we say this all the time. With how about just planning mom's? I hate to say it. Mom's death. What her assets? Does she have her updated beneficiaries? Does she have an updated? Oh, which will? is a really important thing. If you're somebody that has an IRA pension, uh, if you have insurance, health insurance, uh, term life insurance that, that asks for beneficiaries, make sure you put a beneficiary on those accounts because otherwise they don't flow to the beneficiary, they go into the estate right. and could be probated and it just is an expense that you shouldn't have to bear. Right, a, a big expense. It could be thirty-seven percent compared to your twelve percent. Right. So, but you know, if that's why we're here, 
and we do what we do because we want to make sure you have the right plan, the right course. Right. That, and that's, you know, and, and you don't have to feel funny if you're not a client, a paying client of EG Tax because we want to help. And we, we may say to you when you get that love letter, oh, well, actually the return that was done wasn't correct. And so we fix it for you and you don't owe the money. But sometimes we'll say, oh, well, no, this is what you owe, you know, and, and but it's always good to get that second opinion. Yes, for sure. All right. Sure. Yes. All right. Until next week, I'm Esther Golias, the tax lady from EG Tax. You can go to our website at egtax.com. Ask the tax lady. Happy to help you. Uh, you can call our corporate headquarters at 632-7886. Until next week, I'm Esther Golias, the tax lady. Christopher Fabian, thanks for listening. God bless. The previous program was paid for by EG Tax.